And then above that is the world of, um, of the angels, which is Malakut. And above that is the realm of command, which is Jabarut. And then there's the, the realm of the primal will, which is Wahut. And then sort of above and beyond and outside of all of those realms, completely transcended is something called Hahut, which is the realm of He. And that's all that can ever be said about it. Oh, what? He. H-E. Ha. Oh, uh, you're right. Okay. Hahut, right? So it's a, it's a large subject. Um, and we did spend a considerable amount of time in our last, uh, in part one, discussing what those all meant. But I would, I would advise you to take a look at this chart that I've created because there's quite a bit of detail there taken mm -hmm. from the, uh, the writings of Abba Paha. You can see the, the references at the, at the bottom of the second page. Right. The commentary on the Quranic verses considering, concerning the overthrow of the Byzantines, which is where the stages of the soul is, is available on the high library online. So I know that's a lot of new material to throw at you all at once. Um, Thanks, Mark. It gives you a lot of homework. <laughs> hey, Mark, Mark, please. You know, I, I think you could also say to people, look up the ringstone symbol. The yeah. ringstone symbol has three levels, but between the uh, highest one and the middle one is the fourth level or Lahut. And between the middle one and the lower one would be uh, Malakut, I believe. Yep. Anyway, so that, that's a, Abdu'l-Baha suggested that as a symbol for looking quickly at levels of reality and the importance of the manifestation as being between the higher realms of the divine and the, the lower realms of creation, including us. Um, anyway, uh, but that's helpful. It, check out the ringstone symbol. <laughs> it's sort of the ABC version of all of that stuff that Mark made a, you know, a big chart of. Mm -hmm. Does that help, Zanisha? <clears throat> yes, thank you. No, okay. it, it helps to even know that the, the descriptions and I know where to read more, the references there. Thank okay. you. Yeah, send me an email if you need more. Uh, I can uh, send you some of my notes from last time. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, plagued with questions or wondering what the heck I'm doing. Can you see where I'm going with this, Margaret? Yeah, um, yeah, I've come back. Um, people can live their lives completely heedless of anything beyond this realm. And in, in doing that, are they not developing any spiritual qualities? Are they um, left out? Of the realms after death, or what? What do you do? I mean, this is all leading to advanced spiritual states that all of us struggle with. But even if we're aware of them, they're pretty lofty concepts. Yes. Like, so what about people who totally ignore this? What about and what about infants that die within moments of birth, or that are stillborn, or whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a feeling that <clears throat> uh, God has set up this system in such a way that whether you're a believer or not, you're going to be faced with a huge list of occasions for you to learn the lessons that you need in order to be able to uh, be prepared for the next world. Um, suffering seems to play an enormous role in that. And there seem to be no end of reasons to suffer, ways to suffer. Uh, I don't. I, I mean, I can only think of what Abdul Baha said when he was consoling the the parents of infants who had died or who had been stillborn, and he made it very clear that there was a very special place in the garden in the next world that uh, extra special care would be given that individual. 
I can only take him at his word. But <clears throat> I don't know. Anybody else have thoughts on this? I'm, I'm not the authority on that subject by any means. Harold, Jack, anybody else want to take a stab uh, at that? I agree, Margaret. Some of the statements of Abdul Baha sounded very categorical, didn't they? Unless you acquire these spiritual virtues, you're not going to have everlasting life. And I think, you know, we have to look at many more passages before we make such a conclusion because, you know, then we start sounding like evangelical Christians who say, you know, unless you're saved and you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you know, you're destined for hell and all this sort of stuff. Uh, I think you know, the soul, Abdu'l-Baha says that existent doesn't become non-existent. So wherever we are on the spiritual continuum, however far or near to God we are, that's our starting point at death. So obviously from the text that Mark provided us with, Somebody who has, Margaret, as you say, lived blissfully, <laughs> rather an ironic word in the context, blissfully without thinking of heavenly realities at all, um, then obviously that person is going to be handicapped unless, you know, the grace of God can never be excluded from any of this. I mean, ultimately... Nobody knows. You know, Baha'u'llah makes this clear in the Ikhan that pious uh, souls have turned away from God in the final moment and sinners have turned to God and become saved, to use a Christian term. So there are a lot of mysteries connected with this and none of us, of course, really knows ultimately in the end the destiny of any other soul. We don't even know the destiny of our own soul. But short of the grace of God, which can accomplish anything, of course, the Baha'i prayers tell us that. Um, I think logically, using the logical mind, it's safe to say that the journey toward God starts at the place, at the point that you achieved in during mortal life. And then, you know, so the journey is, is harder. Uh, obviously, Abdul Baha says, Baha'u'llah says too, we will, all of us, know what we've done in this life. There will be an, an evaluation, there will be a review. And, um, the judgment, if you like. Um, so we don't know, but I, I think the point is we can just be very, very grateful, all of us, that we, we have come to know and love God in this lifetime. Obviously, we're all fra very far, speaking for myself, from acquiring the the spiritual virtues I would like to acquire. And, you know, we just, we pray for those who've lived their lives as if God doesn't exist. I mean, Abdul Baha does say that there, there's two spirits in man. He says, one, he will live for God and one, he will live for the world alone. And a lot of people, most people live in the spirit of the world alone. They never think about transcendental realities. And maybe that's, perhaps that, that's the type of individual Abdul Baha's referring to. Now, that poses another question. Why don't they think about transcendental realities and how is it that we do? And that's, that's a whole other, big other discussion. But uh, anyway, that's a few comments, Mark, in, in the way I look at it. But we should never 
never ever assume that because somebody's not a Baha'i or even a believer in God, that they're lost, you know, to the mercy of God. That's, <laughs> you know, we just, we should just never come to that kind of conclusion because every soul is capable of growth and development in this life and after death. And Mark is encouraging us all to, you know, um, develop that quality is to die before we die, as you said in one of your other courses, Mark, to, to die to the, to the self and, and a, a try, a strive to attain, attain that new birth while we're here. Ingrid had her hand up. Ingrid had her hand up, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I just I just wanted to to say, I mean, I agree we 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 start there and, you know, wherever we leave off here, we start there. You know, that seems seems fairly clear. But for those people who just really didn't think about spirituality or God or, or agnostics or whatever, I mean, they have some divine everyone has those sparks you know those gems within them and and so they they will also have a measure right a measure of of virtues and gems that they've developed in their lives we all know people who don't have any thought of god but they they can be kind they can be generous they can they can have you know they can be curious they can be beautiful artists and creators they they all have all kinds of attributes that that's where that's where they will start right so so you know every everyone will start from wherever they're at you know whether they whether they had this this extra insight that we've all been blessed to have um, and that other spiritual people of other faiths have been blessed to have whether they have that or not they they have they're not going to go empty handed i don't think that's an excellent point. Yeah. Oh, Heather, yes, please. Uh, you I don't need... yeah. Heather. I was, I was wondering what you thought Abdul Baha meant by philanthropic deeds. Like, I was thinking when I first read this, uh, philanth like giving to charities. Uh, but it doesn't say that. It says deed. Well, giving to money it is a, a deed, but it's not the same sort of deed as going out and actually interacting with people in a way that helps them. So I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that little phrase through philanthropic deeds. Not me. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody? Any takers? I don't Anybody think we something? should just discount giving money. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are many rich people who don't give a cent to for philanthropic deeds. So I don't think we should assume that giving away wealth isn't going to affect the soul. I mean, Abdul Baha. Uh, encouraged Andrew Carnegie to do just that, and he did it. He built the libraries. Uh, he endowed, you know, God knows what else he did, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that he did that because he met Abdul Baha, and Abdul Baha, of course, knew he was a very wealthy man and asked him to use his wealth in the service of others. So I think that. I mean, this is just an individual opinion. The wealthy who do that, I think it's a great thing. And it does, uh, it does affect their soul. Surely it must affect their soul if they're uh, alleviating poverty or, or, or providing benefits to mankind in some other way. Um, but I think, Heather, you're suggesting something more concrete, like getting out and serving in the soup kitchen. Something, something, something like that, which I haven't, well, I've only done it once. I better get back and do it a little more. <laughs> Ingrid, you had a thought too? Yeah, my, my thought was not, not 
that it needs to be so specific to, you know, to serving in a, in a soup kitchen, but, but just service to others, you know, to be, to be philanthropic, to be, you know, look, look at all the examples of, of Abdul Baha just going and, you know, caring for the sick. I mean, just just being of service, right? I think I think that would possibly could be one of the, one of the meanings. In in addition, of course, you know, if you have wealth to to support, you know, causes and expend that wealth, also on service service to humanity. Heather, did you have further points to make on that? Um, no, it, it's just a, I was when I was thinking of it as philanthropic donations um i mean are we are we're encouraged to give money to the fund we're as as a way that because with that we're like and the hokukula we're we're changing society we're changing the world whereas giving to little things um and i'm not saying we shouldn't and i i mean i i give money to uh like you know the food bank and stuff too and i'm sure everybody else does but um, that those don't have as much power as giving money to the fund does. That, that's what I was thinking of this. And then I thought, well, deeds, like we were saying that, you know, deeds of kindness and helpfulness and all that sort of stuff and how we treat people are also are philanthropic deeds. I see Bill's Bill, got his Bill, hand up. Yeah. Bill has got his hand up there. Um, yeah. So with reference to this, uh, it seems to me that, that uh, with, 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 if we don't include the concourse on high thing, that um, um, we have a physical existence and, and the only thing, and one of the big, uh, the, I think probably the benefit of that physical existence is the ability to do stuff. Uh, and the failure to to leverage that capacity uh, to do good stuff would seem to me to be a major spiritual failure uh, in terms of anyone's spiritual development. Mm -hmm. So I think whether uh, we do stuff by doing stuff to make money and then give that money uh, to, ac to accomplish good things, or whether we do stuff by dishing out uh, gravy at the homeless shelter at six in the morning, uh, uh, you know, these, this is what a physical, this is the value of a physical existence um, if from a spiritual perspective. Otherwise, there's no, there's no use for it. I see Belinda's hand twice with, oh, was it? Sorry. Belinda, did you want to say something? You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Did you want to say something first? I want to pass. You want to pass? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, why don't we uh, leave that for now? Uh, I'm sorry, I have to say I wasn't particularly prepared for that question, but anyway, um, let's move on. I want to take a look at the value of studying previous dispensations. Uh, the Baha'i Faith proclaims the oneness of God, the oneness of mankind, and the oneness of religion. As I understand the last phrase, all religions are one in the sense that they have all been generated from the same source, no matter how dissimilar the terminology used to identify that source may be. Baha'is are taught that each religion has two sets of teachings, an unchanging core of spiritual truths and a profusion of social teachings related to the needs of the audience addressed by each religion. So these social teachings thus display a significant diversity. Although the spiritual truths do not change over time, the words used to articulate them have varied with the changing capacity of their audiences over the centuries, even millennia. The specific vocabulary, as well as the cultural and historical references will all diverge from one religion to another. Given Abdu'l Baha's praise for a wide ranging variety of flowers within a garden, should Baha'is not cultivate an ever deeper appreciation for the diversity of the world's religions? Surely nurturing such unity and diversity is more praiseworthy 
than remaining content with a monotone knowledge of a single religious tradition. I don't know how you feel, but I've always been tremendously curious to know what God had to say to humanity on the apparently uh, countless occasions he has communicated with us. What can we learn about him? What can we learn about human beings and how they've evolved from our previous encounters with our maker? Yes, there will be overlap. Yes, there will be obstacles to be overcome in terms of understanding context and interpreting meanings. Yes, there will be degrees of veiling among the messages. But will we uncover any new insights? Will studying the same divine communications, but now expressed in completely different language, throw familiar spiritual verities into unexpected high relief? Will our investment of time and energy be worth it? I suspect the answer will be yes, but time alone will tell. So what about developing individuals versus society as a whole? In order to fulfill the Baha'i goal of creating an ever advancing civilization, society as a whole and the individual within it must evolve. We must change our present level of consciousness if we are to overcome the many dangers threatening the world during this transition from tumultuous adolescence to serene maturity. The Baha'i faith promotes the development of spiritual awareness as the most effective counter to today's unbridled materialism. The spiritual development we are seeking to delineate in this course must first within, occur within the individual. This inner development involves our vertical dimension. As we begin to accept our spiritual selves, this will instantly have an impact on those around us. Such outer development will include our horizontal dimensions. From the Baha'i writings, we now know that our goal is to become increasingly aware of the trust of God hidden deep within ourselves and to allow it to surface more and more prominently in our day-to-day -day lives. The question is, how can we do this? Once we figure this out, we can contemplate what needs to be done individually and collectively to foster such growth on a wider scale. It's clear that we need to turn inward to develop our inner capacities to explore the unseen realms if we are to develop or to deepen our spirituality and to widen our embrace of humanity, nature, and God. So let's talk about mapping the territory. Before we proceed, I'd like to introduce a word of caution here concerning the maps or models or schemas we will be studying in the second half of this course. You may have already come across the idea that the map is not the territory. This important idea was originally expressed by the Polish-American philosopher and engineer, Alfred Korzybski, who lived from 1879 to 1950. It had first appeared in his 1931 article called A Non-Aristotelian System and Its Necessity for Rigor in Mathematics and Physics. There he explained that a map is not the territory it represents, but if correct, it has a similar structure to the territory, which accounts for its usefulness. In other words, he used it to convey the fact that people often confuse models of reality with reality itself. Okay, so now we come back to our readings. So let me do the share screen thing again. And we're at number 14. So I'm wondering if Danielle can read this one for us. Reading number 14. According to Korzybski, models stand to represent things, but they are not identical to those things. Even at their best, models require interpretation. They are imperfect because they are, by definition, an abstraction of some larger complexity. Furthermore, 
we often misunderstand their limitations, preferring an incorrect model to no model at all. It's human nature. Mark uh, Bezudo, the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So notably, Ken Wilber borrowed this idea in several of his books to point to the yawning gap between maps and the realities they seek to portray. So for example, his AQUAL model, A-Q-A-L, which stands for all quadrants, all levels, which we will go into at some point in some detail in about uh, a month and a half or so, uh, is useful as a pointer towards reality, but is not intended as a substitute for that reality. Okay, how about Jack? Number 15. Every one of my books has at least one sentence, usually buried, that says the following. This is the version found in the Atman Project, 1980. Quote, there follows then the story of the Atman Project. It is a sharing of what I have seen. It is a small offering of what I have remembered. It is also the Zen dust you should shake from your sandals. And it is finally a lie in the face of the mystery which alone is. In other words, all of my books are lies. They are simply maps of territory, shadows of a reality, gray symbols dragging their bellies across the dead page, suffocated signs full of muffled sound and faded glory, signifying absolutely nothing. And yet it is the nothing, the mystery, the emptiness alone that needs to be realized, not known but felt, not thought but breathed, not an object but an atmosphere, not a lesson but a life. Ken Wilbur, forward. December 2002, Frank Visser, Ken Wilbur thought his passion. So Mark, is that Wilbur who wrote that or Visser? I'm a bit No, confused. no, that's, that's the uh, foreword that Ken Wilbur wrote to this book, which is about him. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's, he's talking about his own work there? Yes, he is. Certain amount of detachment there which is good to see more humility than you would expect from him but anyway i love drama i think yeah it's very well written i think i just love that passage <clears throat> so wilbur goes on to strongly encourage his readers to engage in the forms of spiritual practice required to achieve the states of consciousness he is mapping for themselves and this continues that quote, uh, number 16. I think um, Peter might be the one for this. <clears throat> there follows a book of maps, hopefully more comprehensive maps, but maps nonetheless. Please use them daily as a reminder to take up dancing itself, to inquire into this self of yours, the self that holds this page in this cosmos all in a single glance, and then express that glory in integral maps and sing with passion of the sights you have seen, the sounds that the tender heart has whispered only to you in the late hours of the quiet night. And come and join us and tell us what you have heard in your own trip to Bermuda, in the vibrant silence that you alone own, and the radiant heart that we alone together can discover. Ken Wilbur for uh, thought is a passion. Mm -hmm. So did anybody else uh, pick up on that uh, reference to the Bermuda? Tie it back to the, my father's conversations with a fish which took place in Bermuda. There's a synchronicity for you. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Anyway. So let's talk about Abdul Baha's map. So 
what Wilbur has just said is an excellent description of the limitations opposed upon even the brightest human minds. We must be ever mindful of these limits, particularly as we struggle to expand the boundaries of human knowledge into the spiritual realms. Because we will be relying so heavily on Sri Aurobindo and Ken Wilbur as guides on our journey, we must remind ourselves that no matter how enlightened they seem for our vantage point, no matter how exalted the expressions of their spiritual visions become, they are still in the final analysis, human beings. But can the same thing be said about the Baha? As we discovered in last winter's course of the Baha as interpreter, while he forever remained a human being, his station far exceeded that of other men. His illustrious station is conveyed through his titles, the mystery of God and the center of the covenant. Uh, let me see here. How about you, Zilda? This, uh, this one would be good for you, 17? Sure. <clears throat> it would be a mistake to consider Abdu'l-Baha as an ordinary human being who persevered in his efforts until he emptied himself of selfish desire and consequently was appointed by Baha'u'llah as his successor. Such a concept is contrary to the belief of those who have embraced the faith of Baha'u'llah. Abdu'l-Baha was created by God for the sole purpose of becoming the recipient of God's revelation in this age. We shall never know his real station because he was the mystery of God, a title conferred upon him by Baha'u'llah. He was the priceless gift of Baha'u'llah to mankind. So Teherzadeh explains that Baha'u'llah conferred upon him infallibility and conferred all the powers of the manifestation upon him. And that's from the same book on page 103. However, this does not mean that this transformed him into a manifestation of God. This widespread misunderstanding about the Baha'u'llah station among the early Baha'i community compelled Shoghi Effendi to clarify Abdu'l-Baha's station in the following passage. Uh, how about Hangame? Do you feel up to reading today? Absolutely. Excellent. That Abdu'l-Baha is not a manifestation of God, that he gets his light, his inspiration, and sustenance direct from the fountainhead of the Baha'i revelation, that he reflects even as a clear and perfect mirror, the rays of Baha'u'llah's glory, and does not inherently possess that indefin indefinable yet all pervading reality, the exclusive possession of which is the hallmark of prophethood, that his words are not equal in rank though they possess an equal validity with the utterances of Baha'u'llah. From these statements, we can safely conclude that Abdu'l Baha's interpretations are in a league of their own. No one other than a new manifestation of God can match the authority he possesses when he makes a pronouncement on something. For this reason, we will hold his descriptions of the stages of the soul in his commentary on the Surah of Rum as the gold standard by which everything else is weighed. Okay, so let's look at alternative maps. Recognizing that a map is not the same thing as the territory it charts, are we currently in a position to accurately diagram the territory Abdu'l Baha describes so intimately and so lovingly for us? Are there any forerunners in this mapping exercise that we need to become aware of? Surely we would be well advised to maximize the use of all the discoveries mankind has made and all the tools it has developed over the centuries in our efforts to grow beyond our present limitations. For centuries, the West has specialized in the investigation and transformation of the outer physical world. 
For millennia, the East has devoted its attention to the inner world, particularly in India through the various practices of yoga. The good news is that both Aurobindo and Wilbur have produced comprehensive maps of human spiritual development. As Baha'is, we are in a rather unique position. We can now evaluate the meticulous maps produced by these two modern day exponents of Hinduism and Buddhism, which incorporate thousands of years of personal spiritual experimentation, as well as the latest discoveries made by contemporary social science scientists against Al the Baha's divinely inspired authoritative description of the stages of the soul. That's the agenda. What about additional benefits? There are other advantages associated with this strategy as well. Becoming familiar with their differing terminology will expand our horizons and connect us more tightly with our own religious tradition beyond the confines of the Abrahamic tradition. Acquainting ourselves with the Hindu and Buddhist perspectives on spiritual development will make it far easier for us to relate to the millions of believers of these two ancient faiths. Now that Hindus and Buddhists are our neighbors and our colleagues, we will be poised to interact with them with an enhanced respect and knowledge, which may well open their hearts to us for the first time. Besides, listening to us ask well-informed questions about their religious beliefs will undoubtedly predispose them to returning the favor when the Baha'i faith is mentioned. So I have three caveats I'd like to introduce though. First of all, both Hinduism and Buddhism base their mystical traditions squarely on the shoulders of real world guru disciple relationships. The Baha'i faith, which views every human being as equal in status, does not support such unequal relations. As individual Baha'is choose to engage in spiritual practice, the question of ongoing guidance and mentorship will no doubt arise. How will the faith respond to this long established need? Will consultation with our peers be sufficient in times of a spiritual emergency? Will we be counseled to emulate this type of relationship through the creation of personal relations with Abdu Baha in the Abha kingdom? Regardless of future developments on, issue, on this issue, I believe it need not impair our investigation of spiritual reality as presented by Aurobindo and Wilbur. Number two, Sri Aurobindo has a sophisticated understanding of karma and rebirth, as does Buddhism, perhaps even more so. Abdu'l Baha offers a nuanced critique of the doctrine of reincarnation in section 81 of Some Answered Questions. While we do not have time to consider the subtleties of these two explanations, again, we will not need to be overly concerned with the subject here. Number three, the exact nature of spiritual practice, which is known as sadhana uh, in Sanskrit, in Aurobindo's and Wilbur's view is a bit unclear due to the countless spiritual paths tailored to individual followers. Aurobindo's integral yoga, for instance, includes all forms of yoga. Hatha, bhakti, raja, jnana, dream, sleep, bardo, you name it. He also incorporates tantric forms of yoga due to its goal of transforming this world rather than escaping from it. But again, I don't think this is going to limit what we need to strive for. So I want to leave you with four teasers. Looking ahead, next week we will review or start to review the life of Sri Aurobindo and to a lesser extent that of Mira Richard, his spiritual consort for over 25 years, who became known as the mother. I'd like to leave you with two thought-provoking quotations of his and two from the mother to give you a foretaste of his all-embracing vision. Okay, number 19. 
Uh, no, Sylvie's not feeling well, so I won't ask her. Mary, are you wanting to read or? No, okay. Uh, Sanisha, how about you for number 19? Yes, I can read. Excellent. Number 19. Paganism increased in man the light of beauty, the largeness and height of his life, his aim at a many-sided perfection. Christianity gave him some vision of divine love and charity. Buddhism has shown him a noble way to be wiser, gentler, purer. Judaism and Islam, how to be religiously faithful in action and zealously devoted to God. Hinduism has opened to him the largest and profoundest spiritual possibilities. A great thing would be done if all these God visions could embrace and cast themselves into each other. But intellectual dogma and cult egoism stand in the way. Sri Aurobindo. Thank you. So that's the first quotation we've had from this man. Uh, I think his aims are similar to the Baha'i faith in terms of its understanding of the unity of world religions. Anyway, we'll have to see more about that. So we will devote much time to Aurobindo's concept of the supermind, a term with unfortunate associations outside of his thought. Here he clarifies his perspective for us. Uh, let me see who we've got left here. Linda O'Neill is not here tonight, I guess. Eh? How about Marie Palmer? Yes, I'd be happy to read. Thank you. Uh, reading 20. <clears throat> the step from man to superman is the next approaching achievement in the Earth's evolution. It is inevitable because it is at once the intention of the inner spirit and the logic of nature's process. Supermanhood is not man climbed to his own natural zenith, not a superior degree of human greatness, knowledge, power, intelligence, will, character, genius, dynamic force, saintliness, love, purity, or perfection. Supermind is something beyond mental man and his limits. It is a greater consciousness than the highest consciousness proper to human nature. Sri Aurobindo, man, a transitional being. Hmm. I'm right now trying to write some of the material on the Superman, and uh, it's uh, challenging. I have to say, it's really a struggle to get your head around it, which is a good thing. It's a growing experience for me. So here are a couple of the mother's assessments of Sri Aurobindo's purpose. Uh, let me see who we have here. Jennifer, how about uh, number 21? Sri Ayubindo has come on earth not to bring a teaching or a creed in competition with previous creeds or teachings, but to show the way to overpass the past and to open concretely the route towards an imminent and inevitable future. The mother, words of the mother. Okay. And let's see, I'm on my third page of people here. Bonnie, how about you? We haven't heard from you yet tonight. Number 22. Sri Abhino came upon earth to teach this truth to men. He told them that a man is only a transitional being living in a mental consciousness, but with the possibility of acquiring a new consciousness, the truth consciousness, and capable of living a life perfectly harmonious, good and beautiful, happy and fully conscious. During the whole of his life upon earth, Sri Abrino gave all his time to establish in himself this consciousness he called super, uh, supramental and to help those gathered around him to realize it, the mother.
Well, here we are. It's not even nine o'clock and we're finished. What's wrong with this picture? Nobody talked tonight. You're all out of practice. Uh, Mark? <laughs> Let's have uh, some Mark, dialogue uh, here. Come on. Yeah. Mark, um, I think you could easily collect a lot of uh, you know, passages in the Baha'i writings that, that critique a lot of this. I mean, maybe we're, we're going to come to this. Um, for example, the, I, the in other words, uh, Wilbur and Aurobindo have spiritually elitist assumptions. And it, the idea of um, a, a supramental existence, um, it, you know, it may well exist. And I'm sure that there's a Baha'i equivalent of it. Um, I think my point is, um, you know, for example, Ab Abdul Baha would tell the story of it would be much better to have a child who has uh, a well-developed moral character and low-developed intelligence than a child that has highly developed intelligence but low, low-developed moral character. Right. Okay. So uh, some some of the things you know we're going to look at look like they're 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 cognitive and super cognitive dimensions, will they include morality? Will they, which, which you could say is the horizontal dimension? Um, I'm afraid some of them don't. Anyway, but that's just my you know, initial take on a lot of Wilbur and Aurobindo. So um, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to read a little bit more about from the Baha'i writings regarding elitism and, and the way it constrains uh, our understanding of some of these concepts. It, uh, the Superman was an idea that Nietzsche developed and that the Nazis took over. That didn't work out too well. Um, so anyway, I'm just throwing out some caveats of my own regarding where I, you know, the, the usefulness of this. I, however, I'm gonna hang in there every inch of the way with you and learn as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that there's a lot of Baha'i writings that counter elitist tendencies. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to bring them along with me as I, as I get into these two figures, Aurobindo and, and Ken Wilbur. Okay. Well, I've got I, something I'd like to, can yeah, I add ahead, something please, to yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I, I think maybe that, that um, the super in the word, whatever it is, super normal or, is, you know, it does remind us of Nietzsche and uh, the Superman, this thing. But I, I, I think maybe a better word would have been just non-mental, right? So in other words, not in the world of the mind, the cognitive and intellectual, but consciousness, which is other than it's something else. Um, so that's how I read that. And I, it might have been a unfortunate <laughs> that the word super was used in that uh, that label for, for what it is. But if they're talking about consciousness, it's just who we are. It's isness, whatever. It's not really super anything, but it's not in the mind because the mind, of course, is tremendously limited, uh, limited rather. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, there's something called transpersonal psychology, which is, I think, probably a little uh, easier to take as a, a terminology for this. But I mean, it has its own limitations as it's currently uh, being expressed by people. <laughs> for instance, they're very keen to explore uh, psychedelic drugs, etc., that, that bring them to higher states of consciousness on a short term basis. But uh, Harold, you'll find that uh, the word elitist doesn't apply to these two particular fellows, uh, particularly Ken Wilbur, because he, in his all quadrant, all level um, construction, if you like, he addresses ethics very clearly as something that has to be on a par. For instance, he goes after, um, there's a quite a longstanding phenomenon of, of um, gurus or whatever coming from the East, uh, you know, at a very high level of spiritual attainment, yet 
they abuse women, they uh, love money, they drink, et cetera, et cetera. So they, all these guys have clay feet. And so he has a way of analyzing that so that it actually makes sense. You can understand that it's important for us to not only uh, aim for the growth in your spiritual development, but also to, to be a, an excellent member of society who is compassionate, who, who has all the attributes that the Baha'i faith has to, to offer. Uh, it's a big subject. But I just want to raise a, a caution and say there's no way that either one, I know on the surface it looks like they could both be elitist because of the terminology I've just thrown at you. But from what I've seen, that it doesn't apply. But please, you know, keep that, keep our, our feet to the fire on that particular topic because it's an important one. Okay, I saw some hands. Mark, Alan, I don't first know. First, David, and then Alan, I think. Okay. I, I just I just wanted to say that you know uh, we have a tendency to get caught up in language mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, language too um, is not always accurate and uh, so that you, you talk about uh, these maps you know, uh, and models and so on. Language, language too, can uh, um, have a function that way. And I think it's very important for us not to get caught up in language. We're not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's very important, you see, uh, so that um, language does not necessarily mean, you know, that, that um, or, or is, is, a, uh, um, is a reflection of our spirituality. Now, I'm not saying they can't have a, you can't have a, a um, uh, some aspect of it, but a lot of it tends, it has to do with the way we use language. And, um, you know, um, uh, a lot of what we've talked about tonight and, and what you've read, you know, for me, um, um, it's more a question of the human heart. You know, I, I don't understand my own heart. You know, and I'm not talking about my physical heart. I, I do not understand it. But I know that uh, uh, the layers of it in relation to um, uh, the four valleys, and all that you, you've mentioned, Malakut and so on and so forth, all tie in with the human heart. And that the, the, the real land, if I can put it that way, uh, and all that we have uh, to discover with ourselves and uh, act on it is in the human heart. So, um, uh, you know, anyway, that's all I'll say. So, Alan was next, Mark, and then Jack. Okay. And then Bill. I just, I, I just wanted to point out in, in reading 22, um, uh, this, I guess, is the mother, and, and what she says is that uh, Aurobindo gave his time to establish in himself this consciousness he called supramental rather than super. The supra, difference in the, in the meaning, isn't there? Yeah, I think supra implies to me that it is above mental. Yeah, and not super. We, yeah. yeah, and I think that, that if we understand things, uh, Abdul Baha is an example. I mean, he would read people as they walked in the door, <laughs> and he would know what to say to them. He would know their state. Um, there's this lovely picture of Abdu Baha that I particularly like, and he's walking down this sort of back alley type street, probably in Akka, walking away from the camera uh, that took the picture. And, and the impression that I had is, is that this was an individual whose spiritual sensors were out in front of him looking to pick up 
where he should go and who he should talk to and what the topics might be. Mm. It's, it's beyond mental. You know, it's got nothing to do with intelligence. It's got something to do with spiritual susceptibilities. Well put. Yeah. Okay, so the next it, is Jack, Jack and then Joey. Okay. Well, you know, we're going to make inevitably comparisons with the Baha'i faith as Mark is doing this. And uh, Sri Aurobindo's coming out of a Hindu tradition, although he was, Mark is going to tell us more about this. He was cosmopolitan in his religious knowledge, I'm sure. I think he studied in the West, did he not, Mark, yes, as well? Did. Um, but this supra or super, whatever, if it's supra, this is completely, I mean, based on this one quote, I mean, Mark has scarcely started, you know, so we shouldn't be making a lot of assumptions, but making this uh, based on this one quote, this is very typically Hindu in the approach. It's, it's individualistic, it aims, it's based on the concept that if we develop uh, an illumined mind, an enlightened mind, uh, th this is the supreme, you know, in the West, recall, you recall when the Beatles brought Maharishi Mahesh Yogi <laughs> over and elevated everybody's consciousness. You know, he was the fool on the hill who sees the sun going down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, this is quite typical of this the whole approach of Hinduism, which is the development of the self, which is a very different approach from what we're what we're attempting to do as Baha'is, obviously. I mean, we are trying to, to evolve ourselves, but we also have a collective form of action. I don't know if Sri Aurobindo is going to talk about that, but Marcus, obviously he's going to tell us, but it's natural for us to, uh, to make comparisons and I'd, I'd be interested to, to see what, uh, how um, both he and Wilbur develop this idea of a super consciousness or a supra, super consciousness or a supra mental consciousness. And it would be very interesting. Uh, what we don't wanna do is what I saw one, one person do to Mark at a far side several years ago and who basically said, you know, this stuff was all useless compared with Baha'u'llah. I was very embarrassed at that particular time. And I'm sure Mark recalls uh, that, that, that particular evening. And, and of course, nobody here is uh, <laughs> hopefully in that category. <laughs> Harold, you can keep us honest if you like. You know, that's good. <laughs> You have to prove to us now how humble you're going to be while you're doing that. <laughs> there's Just some please. ABS articles about Ken Wilbur. There, there, there's <laughs> lots of angles on him. You know, I, I don't have to share my own. Um, yeah. I, it, I'm pulling your leg, Harold. No, it, but it, pulling, there's always a serious side to jokes. No, I, I, I have to keep myself uh, careful. Because, um, you know, I, somehow, you see, I went through, um, I, I lived in Berkeley, California, which was like the spiritual promised land. Right. And I studied a lot of these kinds of systems like Wilbur and, uh, and gurus too, various gurus. And I have to admit, Wilbur and Aurobindo seem very comprehensive compared to some other, other types of gurus. Right, they're, they're interdisciplinary, and uh, but see, Mark, the distinction between individual and society that you laid out, the, the twofold moral purpose. That phrase is in a lot of the the, the the Ruhi books. Twofold moral purpose. I think it's foundational 
for, for, for Baha'is to look at the development both of the individual and society. And the meaning of individual human life is partly contributing to, to society in ever widening circles and ever, ever advancing global civilization. This is something a little new. So both Aurobindo and, uh, and Wilbur didn't catch this light of a new revelation that emphasizes the society as much as the individual, right? Anyway, um, so we can round them out a little bit, I believe. Mark, I just want to let you know that Joey's been waiting and Lori. I was just about to say Joey. Um, I find the, for myself, that language is key. I know when I first started reading Baha'i writings, I had to go back and try and figure out language in the context of, you know, how it was written and in the context of the time. And when you said you were going to do Aurobindo, I thought, uh oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble now. So I read ahead a bit and I realized. I was spending a lot of time, and I think I probably will in the future, have to spend a lot of time on understanding the language he uses, because it is a bit foreign to, um, to myself. And it's, it just is very involved. And even in the structure in which he writes. Um, so, I would recommend to people that they read some of his things first because it's it's very difficult. I mean, even this supramental, I went through that for about an hour at least, and I still don't understand. It's an extremely challenging thing to get your head around just by its very nature. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't have even mention it so far in advance of the uh, the material that we're going to actually get to that that content. That doesn't really happen in any major way until the sixth class. Oh, but your your point is well taken. It's uh, it's a process of familiarizing yourself with an, uh, a relative unknown, and uh, and people are not usually comfortable with that. So I would hope that you remain as open-minded as you possibly can. Um, try not to rush to judgment because uh, I think there's some real gems here that uh, we're gonna be lesser for not appreciating. So I've, I've spent a great deal of time reading and uh, contemplating Aurobindo particularly. Uh, he's got a tremendous amount to offer as you'll start to see next week. And the, the great news is, as Jack mentioned, uh, he was educated in the West and became extremely good at it. Uh, he was ended up at Cambridge for crying out loud and had the best scores in Greek and Latin of anybody in the 13 years that uh, one of the people who was grading him had ever seen. So he had a flair for language. He, he knew, I think by the time he was done, he probably knew 15 languages. So, uh, but he, he is a beautiful bridge between the Western world and the Eastern world, as you'll understand. That's why I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time actually going through some of his events in his life and some of the things he had to say about those events. Okay, so who was the last, the next Lori person? Lori has her hand up, she's ah, very Lori. patient. And then I see Bill. Oh, and Bill, sorry, Bill. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. Well, I'm really looking forward to this for several reasons. And the first thing I had to get straight in my mind, as several people have mentioned, um, you know, we're so used to, as Baha'is thinking of, developing ourselves, our own spiritual growth and also advancing civilization so to me i just have to realize that we're going to be talking about not so much about 
advancing civilization, but looking at the other part. And I'm really going to appreciate looking at sources that I haven't looked at because I recently took a course from Carlton's Learning and Retirement Program, and it was about the different religions and what they believed about the afterlife. And the prof would start with sort of a very brief summary of their religion and then talk about the afterlife. And for me, it was all foreign, but it was so good to know what other people think. And when I'm conversing with other peoples who might be from a Jewish background or maybe they're a Buddhist, I will have some of that vocabulary so that we could actually have a conversation. So exactly. thank you very much. Exactly, good point. Okay, Bill. So, so, yeah. So, the, when when you when I attend your course, I don't really ask, like, what's this all about? Uh, mostly because I'd be embarrassed too. But um, generally, I really enjoy the way it, it it like opens up gradually over time, like a flower of knowledge, and it's really nice. Uh, but I'm really wondering, like, what are we doing? Uh, here in terms of, you know, are we, are we trying to synthesize the common truths from uh, uh, the various, you know, from the Eastern philosophies uh, uh, that are, that are common to um, uh, the Baha'i faith and uh, as it relates to the Ark of Ascent? Uh, are we looking just for different perspectives around that same, same uh, uh, things to get around this, these same things from a different uh, cultures to to get a better understanding of what of what the Baha'i faith is is presenting us, or uh, are we just uh, essentially exploring the 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 essence of spiritual ascent as it's seen in the language of others? What, what's our objective? What what, what, what do we, um, I think what Lori just said about uh, giving us the language to speak uh, in, in multiple cultures uh, by having this kind of comparative religion under, you know, understanding is really good, but I'm kind of wondering what we're doing. Okay. Uh, the sense that I have is that these two people in particular are going to have some um, details to share about those levels of consciousness that Abdu Baha talks about in the stages of the soul that will help us to get a, a much clearer picture of what he was talking about. That's really the goal. What light can they shed on that, to me, fundamentally important document in terms of not just our individual spiritual attainments, but what we do to how we set up society to uh, foster that kind of growth. Once we're no longer materialistic, what then? Has nobody ever thought about the what then? Yes, they have. They've been thinking about it for 5,000 years, but we don't know anything about it because we're stuck in our own religion. So let's hear what they have to say. Maybe some of it will be useful. And if it isn't, okay. But I, I personally, I find it is useful. Can I throw in a comment? Sure. I liken this to comments in the faith about a spiritual economic system. There's not a lot of detail there, but if economists start writing about how we can actualize that, I think that would be very interesting. So there are levels of detail that I think we'll see in Aurobindo and Wilbur that are not in the writings. The, the general concepts are there, but these people, as Mark have said, well, in the case of the Hindus, have been exploring these ideas for thousands of years. So there's probably something worth looking at. Yeah, to me, the Baha'i faith is a, is a, a lens that we can used to examine all of the, the 
accomplishments that we've made as a human species over the last thousands and thousands of years. What, and what I, what I was talking about when I was talking about Michelle is that once you've um, once you've attuned yourself to the light that you saw coming through Baha'u'llah, you can see it in other places in the world that didn't know anything about Baha'u'llah, but they were alive to him or to that light. They saw it. They expressed it in ways that were unique to themselves. So that's what I've been looking for. And these are two people that I find uh, have it in spades. So, okay, so they're not Baha'is. They don't know much about the Baha'i faith. So what? <laughs> God has not forsaken them because yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Graham, you haven't said much tonight. What are you thinking? Well, not to change the subject, but I really want to say something. Okay. We started with a beautiful part, which is the commentary on the Hadith Qasi by yes. Adulba. Yeah. In honor of this holy year, this special year, the 100th anniversary, I just want us to think that, and I hope the friends will find the, the provisional translation of this commentary. Because imagine in teenage years, Abdul Baha wrote this document. I think it's about 30 pages or so. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I think, you know, people say, what miracles you have in the Baha'i faith? Really, I consider this commentary by Abdul Baha on this is like a miracle. Because can you imagine in teenage year? I, I'm sure if you read more about what people said about this commentary, you can't believe it. So I just want us to celebrate this during this holy year of Abdul Baha. Now, the, 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 we run into a language problem though right away from what you were, you were saying that there are probably a lot of people who have made comments about this commentary. But I'm willing to bet that a great number of them are in Persian and Arabic, and that have never been translated. Am I right? Well, as as you have shown some of the provisional translation by Mujan moment of this commentary, yeah. So we could find some more of, of this, and uh, if I find something, I'll share it. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. Has anybody else uh, raised a hand or? Oh, there's yeah. one, Melinda. Yeah. Hi, um, I was thinking about Sri Aurobindo and the time and he lived and where he came from. And uh, India, very interesting place. It was a meeting place for Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam and the Judeo-Christian religion or, or Christianity. Uh, so, so two, uh, oh, and the Zoroastrians as well, because there's a Zoroastrian community in India. So India is a very interesting place in that all these religions were there with populations behind them, large or small. So Sri Aurobindo must have been well aware of that. But I think also there's a bit of context here uh, that I think may have been playing a part. You mentioned that he got his uh, very excellent education both in India but in Europe as well and in England. Um, there's an element of what we now call decolonization going on because I think among other things, he was trying to um, uh, bring an ancient practice into the modern world and give it validity uh, in a situation where the powers that be often didn't give it real validity. Um, uh, so there, there's that element too, and attempting to bring the not as others have done the knowledge of this ancient practice and religion into the Western world in terms the West could understand it. Sadly, we have taken to the more material aspects of um, yeah. yoga practice in terms of all the asanas and all that stuff, and. Um, 
my cousin, was, who was a Swami actually, um, had quite a, delivered to me quite a rant one day on that topic. Um, and he was quite right. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention those things as we go ahead because I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Mark, could I say something about this quote I put up here from Max Müller? Yes. He who knows what religion knows none. Uh, he, he's called the father of comparative religion, and he himself said he translated the sacred books of the East. He translated about, I don't know, maybe you know, Mark, 15 volumes, 13 volumes oh, of... Oh, he himself? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure how many he did. But finding out about somebody's religion is a way of, it's, it's an entry point to the culture. Yes. It, it's an entry point to the way of life. And so it's not without reason that Abdul Baha encouraged the study of comparative religion when he was in America because he said it was a way of eliminating you know, prejudice and fostering religious unity if we look for the, the common points, the substratum. Of course, if you're going to look at the theologies, man-made theologies, you're going to see nothing but a lot of division. So it depends what you want to focus on. Now, Max Muller himself said there was a lot of rubbish in religion. Okay. I'm kidding. And, and there is a lot of rubbish in religion. But he also said, I must say the Baha'i faith excluded. <laughs> that sounds very uh, nationalistic, doesn't it? But, but he also said there were gems, there were jewels in there. And that's what we, that's what we have to find. And that's what Mark is going to help us to... Uh, Find out. I mean, for heaven's sake, Baha'u'llah says all of these religious systems come from God. It's right there in our own scriptures. So, I mean, nobody's giving you a hard time. I don't, I don't interpret it that way. Harold's saying we're going to keep you honest. Okay, fine. That's good. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Get, in, get the gems, get the jewels in there. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, folks, we've come to our time. Everybody had enough? <laughs> we take a break and see each other in a week. Yes, thank indeed. you, Mark. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Great to be oh, thanks, thanks, Mark. It's great. <laughs> thanks, Peter. Very interesting. It was very, yes, yes. As I've said to you before, you're very courageous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe more now than ever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Aloha. Okay, Aloha. 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 Aloha